really thank you, Professor Fischer, for your really nice presentation. I'm honored, obviously, to be here and to start my presentation that is about the hyper response. So let's go straight to my faculty disclosure and let's start with the concept of hyper response. As was clearly explained before, the number of hacks is a crucial thing in IVF. Indeed, we already know that if we retrieve enough number of hacks, we can improve the chance to have a live birth at the end of the IVF cycle. And it was clear since uh, 10 years ago in this uh, very nice publication in which was demonstrated that when we are talking about fresh cycles, we need probably 10 to 15 whole sites in order to get the highest chance of live birth. But recently this concept was superseded by the fact that we can now cryostore all eggs after ovarian stimulation. So now we are moving from the idea of a live birth rate in a fresh cycle to the idea to cumulative live birth rate, summing what we achieve from a fresh cycle and what we achieve from frozen cycles. And it is clear that considering cumulative live birth rate, if we retrieve probably more than 15 hex, could be good, could be fine to optimize the cumulative live birth rate. But retrieve more hacks means also, as was clearly explained before by Professor Nsukara and Professor Rubaldi, that we have more chance to obtain euploid blastocysts. So more sight means more euploid blastocysts. That's why it's very important to take into account how many hacks we could achieve from the patient that we are treating. And we also know that the cumulative life birth rate dramatically change according to the number of eggs that we retrieve. That's why, that's why we identify women that have a suboptimal response that retrieve four to nine eggs that is different for a normal response that retrieve 10 to 15 eggs. So we definitely know that according to the number of host sites, we can have two or three scenario, a poor of our response retrieve less than three hex, suboptimal response, four to nine hex, or normal response, 10 to 50 or more, if we are talking about frozen cycle, hex to retrieve. But what is the hyper response? Because sometimes there is some confusion about confounding and mixing the hyper response with the suboptimal response. While the suboptimal response is just the number of whole sites, the hyper response means definitely our incapability to efficiently exploit the ovarian reserve. So in this case, we have a discrepancy between what we have at the beginning of the cycle in terms of hunter follicle count and what we collect at the end of the stimulation in terms of follicle set triggering or in terms of all sites retrieved. So it is a dynamic concept, not a static concept. And uh, this kind of women are, uh, from clinical point of view, very difficult to identify because from clinical point of view, this woman presented normal menses, uh, very fine basal levels of anti hormone or antrophollicle count and so on. So are very difficult to identify them. But this kind of women, they are unable to adapt to a stress condition. So in this case, we discover the presence of an hyperresponder patient only when we perform an ovarian stimulation. Because under these circumstances, it seems that the biological system of an hyperresponder is not able to counteract the detrimental effect of pituitary suppression that we usually prescribe during controlled ovarian stimulation. So it means that usually from clinical point of view, this condition is masked and we can realize it only when we perform the controlled ovarian stimulation. Take into account the concept of ovarian response that is, you know, the capability to exploit all the potential of female fertility. We are now exploring the pathogenesis of our response that could be different. We could be, could be related to an efficient gonadotropy starting dose, issues or uh, triggering involved with the final side maturation or oocyte pickup. 
but there are some genetic and environmental factors that are very interesting to investigate. Indeed, we know that there are specific genetic traits that we call polymorphism that are quite common that are related with uh, hyperresponse and could influence both the metabolism or the interaction with receptor. Especially the interaction with receptor, so we are talking about the FSH receptor because it's the FSH receptor, the most important one for follicular growth. We know that there is uh, this uh, very common polymorphism that consists in a single amino acidic substitution that provides the in vitro evidence of an FSH resistance receptor. So from in vitro evidence, it seems that this receptor does not work properly when we have both mutated or both polymorphic alleles. From clinical point of view, in this meta-analysis that was published four years ago, we realized that the wild type carriers, so those that carry the wild type form, not the polymorphic tray, show lower amount of gonadotropin and good number of host sites retrieved at the end of the stimulation. So in case of wild type form, we need more medication to achieve a good number of hex. And obviously, also we realized that the wild type form in terms of the number of follicle, in terms of a number of sites had higher number of sites compared with the polymorphic trait. So definitely this kind of polymorphism is related with hyper response profile. This study that was published after our meta-analysis confirmed that this kind of polymorphism is related with the hyper response profile. So when we have the GLE, that correspond to serine amino acidic substitution, we have the polymorphic trait, so we have a reduced resistance, reduced sensibility to exogenous medication. Considering the FSH receptor, this one is the one that is located in promoter position, so it, not, uh, it is not translated in an amino acidic substitution, but even in these circumstances, when we have the ALE, we have a reduced expression of mRNA of FSH receptor. And from clinical point of view, what we rely is that even when we have this ALE, we need more medication and we retrieve less amount of the host sites at the end of the stimulation. Even this kind of evidence was confirmed in the last paper published by Polyzos Group that confirmed that poor polymorphism involving the FSH receptor and the FSH receptor promoter region are both characterized by an upper response profile. So in this case, we need more amounts of medication in order to achieve a good number of X at the end of the stimulation. But apart from uh, the polymorphism related to FSH receptor that are uh, intuitive, that could be related with the ovarian response, even the one that affect the LH beta um, molecules could induce or could promote an hyper response profile. Indeed, we should not think that only FSH matters in terms of follicular growth because also the LH is very important, especially in the last part of ovarian stimulation. And this polymorphism is also related with an hyper response profile. So both the LH and the FSH are very important for follicular growth. So we should consider both systems together in order to identify properly a patient with hyper response profile. Recently, together with other eminent figures, we realized this uh, Delphi consensus about the effect of genetic variants of gonadotrophin and the receptor on ovarian stimulation outcome. And we focus here, obviously, mostly on the, FSA, on the polymorphism that involve the FSH system and the LH system that are very important and very crucial for folliculogenesis, as you know. Another uh, interesting uh, factor that could be related to the hyper response profile are the, could be the viral vector factor. This is a quite old study that we published uh, more than 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago, in which we identified that, in which we discovered that higher level of benzene in follicular fluid could be related with the hyper response profile. So 
in this woman, what we found that is the number of sites retrieved are reduced, but also the FSH basal level was higher in women that expressed and presented high level of benzene in follicular fluid. So we should now think not, all, not only, only to the uh, genetic factor, but should also consider possible involvement of environmental factor in the pathogenesis of the hyper response. <coughs> This is another more recent study that was passed in 2019 in which the phthalate substances, phthalates are very, very common substances that is found in plastic, food, beverage, everything. It's very, very common um, pollutant. And this kind of pollutant was also related with reduced sensitivity to exogenous medication, a reduced number of total oocytes, a mature oocyte retrieved at the end of ovarian stimulation. Thinking about the environmental factor, we should also consider the habits, the lifestyle factor, because also the metabolic factor could be related with the hyper-response profile. Let's see this study in which women, it is a retrospective analysis of more than 5,000 of cycles. And if we stratify the patients according to the BMA, we realize that when the BMA is very high, we have reduced number of hacks compared with the normal BMA, and we need an increased amount of medication. So even the metabolic factor that could be uh, corrected, adjusted, modifying our lifestyle could impact uh, on the ovarian response. So we should also think about it. Another more recent study that was published very, very just in March, just a few months ago, demonstrated that in women with reduced, with uh, increased, sorry, insulin resistance, we found that there is a resistance to exogenous medication. And if you see this study, they stratify patients in the PCOS with insulin resistance, a PCOS without insulin resistance. As you can see, the amount of medication required in this case is higher than in this case. And the amount of oocyte retrieved is significantly reduced compared with PCOS without insulin resistance. And if you see the antrophollicle cancer, you see that the antrophollicle cancer is higher than in the other group. So it means that even a specific research of insulin resistance profile could be important to tailor our stimulation. And this was confirmed also in the control group, because if we consider control group, the presence of insulin resistance is characterized by higher amount of medication and reduced number of effects. So this, uh, this is definitely means that as uh, POR patients that we are thinking that are all the same, if you think about the Bologna criteria, those fitting Bologna criteria that are all put in the same basket, in our opinion, maybe also PCOS patients are not all the same because there are PCOS patients that have insulin resistance and PCOS patients that do not have insulin resistance. And maybe we should start to consider also PCOS patients as, if we can just speculate and just think, as a POR patient that are not the same and deserve specific treatment and specific stimulations. After exploring all the possible pathogenetic cause of hyper-response, now I will illustrate to you more in detail what is the FORT and FOI. As uh, already mentioned by my other colleagues before, the follicle output rate is the ratio between the number of follicles that reach the pre-ovulatory maturation in response to FSH. So it's the ratio between follicles at the triggering and the antrophollicle counts at the beginning of the stimulation. This is the definition that was uh, proposed for uh, FORT. You see the antrophollicle count, 38 millimeters, and the preovulatory follicles, 16 to 22 millimeters. The follicle oocyte index that was proposed recently by Poseidon Group 
together with Professor Estedes and other uh, Poseidon colleagues. In this case, we make, we do a ratio between not the number of follicles at the end of the triggering, but the number of host sites at the end of the triggering in relation with the hunter of follicle count. So in this case, we put in relation the host site number at the hunter of follicle counts. And uh, what this slide clearly showed to you is that the hyper response is not the synonymous of poor response or uh, uh, suboptimal response because we could have also a hyper response profile even in women with the good ovarian response that retrieve nine to 10 eggs, for instance. But in this case, what we realize is that the number of eggs that we retrieve is not consistent with the antrophological count. So we were not able to exploit all the potential that the patient had at the beginning of the stimulation. The distribution of uh, FOI and 14 Poseidon Wuzman was uh, recently explored in this study, and it is clear that the uh, ovarian sensitivity, so the fourth and four is reducing in Poseidon group one and two, but it seems that the Poseidon group two, so the women with advanced reproductive age above 35 years old, show the more uh, lower four and four. So it means that it is more uh, it is more confident, it is more possible to identify an hyper-response profile in Poseidon group, one, Poseidon group 2 comparing with Poseidon group 1. If we uh, analyze these two metrics, there are also some limitations that we should consider. Because first of all, for instance, FORT was developed in the context of the long agonist protocol that was very common 10 or more years ago. And we should also consider that not all the follicle, not only the follicles after 60 millimeters could become a mature whole site, because maybe even a follicles of 14 millimeters could be a valuable uh, or could become a valuable M2 whole site. Another limitation that I think it is more important at this share between these two metrics is the fact that FOI is strictly related with the ovarian sensitivity, but the problem is that we do not properly measure the antra follicle count. So FOI reflects the ratio between the whole sites and the number of antra follicle counts, but it depends on how we measure the antra follicle count, because sometimes we assess the antra follicle counts three, four months, or one year before to do the procedures. But maybe it's more probably to assess it at the beginning of a simulation, because we should consider this one in order to properly assess the FOI measurement. But even the measurement of antra follicle counts have some issue, because it is related to the operator capability, to the machine that we have. So it could be great uh, operator uh, dependent way to assess the antra follicle count. So in this case, we should think that if we would like to use this measurement, we should strictly and we should measure the antra follicle counts and the follicles at the, in, in the late part of the stimulation appropriately. So very, very, in very accurate way. I don't know if uh, the uh, introduction of 3D could improve it because sometimes we use it in common clinical practice, but it's not very user friendly because you should uh, reassess the picture and sometimes there will be some noise, some problem with the machine. So I think that maybe it is the right path, but we should, uh, you know, we need more evidence in order to help us to assess probably the antra follicle counts at the beginning of the simulation, and obviously the right number of the follicles. If we assess FORT and FOI, while FORT reflects, you know, the difference between uh, the follicles uh, here at day one and the follicles at day 10, so it means that you probably assess the ovarian sensitivity, FOI also reflects something that it's related to ovum pickup. So not necessarily women that have uh, low FOI have also a reduced ovarian sensitivity. Indeed, we could find the circumstances that we have uh, normal or good for, but low FOI. So it does mean that probably we have an issue 
beyond the ovarian stimulation, but we have an issue with the triggering or for, or for the oocyte retrieval. Maybe the oocyte retrieval was more difficult, or maybe the operator was not expert, and so on. So when we have consistently low fort and low foil, it means that we have an impaired follicular growth. And in this case, we should think about something to prescribe during the ovarian stimulation. So we could think about uh, modify starting dose, increase the FSH dosage, or adding recombinant LH in specific group. In the other circumstances, we should more think about the triggering that we have performed or to correct any issue that could happen during whole site retrieval, surgical issue or instrumentation. So to conclude, the hyper response are women characterized by an expected and unexpected ovarian response, despite the urban ovarian reserve. So are women in which we were not able to exploit all the potential that we had. There are some uh, pathogenetic factors we should explore more in depth that could be related with hyper response, such as genetic variants, environmental pollutant, or even metabolic disorder that could be related with these uh, uh, characteristics. And the fourth and FOI represent efficient measure to assess the ovarian sensitivity and could assess the efficiency of our stimulation. We could also think about uh, using them for, uh, as a clinical performance indicator. You know that we have clinical performance indicator very important for the biological issue, but we have few clinical performance indicator during our clinical practice. So having uh, a good FOI and good FORT means that in our routinary clinical practice, we are able to perform a proper ovarian stimulation. So let me obviously thank you all the IVF staff in uh, Federico II University, my mentor, Professor Alvigi, all Poseidon guys, and all of you for your attention. Thank you really much. Thank you, Alessandro, for so elegantly uh, clarifying uh, this uh, very important issue of Foy and Ford. And we shall come back to you later uh, during the questions.